Hello, we have um, lecture LT7, um, uh, Origins and Evolution of Architecture Theory, um, being mindful that um, about modernism and postmodernism is the main, um, main agenda of discussion and conversation for architectural theory lectures for this semester. Obviously that there are many other things that influence architecture theory, in particular referring to Kenneth Frampton's book on modern architecture, a critical history where the three things are cultural developments um, from neoclassical architecture to modern architecture, and then urban developments. The one we discuss about Ebenezer Howard and the Garden City, yes, things that were influenced by the Industrial Revolution and technical transformation, just such as structural engineering, which also to do with the Garden City movement. We're very focused on European development, obviously, because these are the conversations that you have when you discuss architecture theory and when you refer to with your peers in architecture. So you need to, to tackle this um, um, part. Oh, sorry, the technical. Structural engineering from 70, 1775 to 1939 and stuff like uh, reinforced concrete and the development of that in the turn of the century. So when we look at industrial revolution, where are we now? We are actually in information age. We were, um, Sorry, I didn't put my video. We are talking about the information age now. And um, so we cannot deny the influence that the art movement or modern art movement have on architecture theory. And these are the some of the isms Cubism, purism, futurism, and constructivism that influence the thoughts of architects during that time, the turn of the century. And um, we start with cubism and these ideas come from an artistic movement. So the, uh, the time frame is between 1908 and 1912, and in particular 1908, referring to Georges Braque and Pablo Picasso. Pablo Picasso earlier in 1907, where they started experimenting with different way to represent art or to do art. Although the influences um, have been said to be tribal art, um, but the work of Paul Cezanne, the Impressionists, the Impressionists was the bridge between the Romanticists and the um, modern art is the Impressionists and how they experimented with art. So um, the key concept underlying cubism is that the essence of an object can only be captured by showing it from multiple viewpoint, multiple points of view simultaneously. So in the romantic, romanticism are, you know, they're trying to make it as real as possible, taking a perspective, uh, whatever is depicted, you know. Um, later, the impressionists played with the technique of how to paint. And then the Cubists decided that do away with um, that and try to represent on a flat surface all the viewpoints together. Much of the information can be found in this link, an introduction to Cubism. 
In the still life with Apple, so we're going back to basics. Yeah, if you were to take art in school, your like your teacher will ask you to do still life, like apples or oranges or uh, glasses or something circular or in that sort of form or plates placed it on the table. So still life is like a compulsory thing that everybody does. So they, it's kind of like um, um, going back to the basics in terms of looking at art again. So when you look at Cezanne's still life with apples, some of them having shadows and there's a certain volume, but some of them don't. So it's, it's not trying to be as real as possible here. It's just playing with composition and um, experimentation. So um, for Cezanne, optics fascinate him. He tried to, um, the naturally occurring forms, the everyday forms, try to go and depict in the geometric essentials, the cone, the cube, and the sphere. He used layers of color to build up surfaces and outline his forms for emphasis. This deep study of geometry in painting led to him becoming a master of perspective. Cezanne was still in the Impressionist period. But then this led to ideas by Braque, still life with Tenora, a departure from, from the previous one. Um, in 19, oh, um, yeah, where is the one that, okay, I've not, I've not shown you the, the, the painting that is, in 1908, in 1908, um, Josh Brock did a cubic, a very, uh, breaking things down and showing it, an object and showing a different perspective on a flat surface, so that was, um, a volumetric circular element that he did. Um, then he they they use any usually it's a musical instrument like clarinet. So another still life, and um, the texture or the you know like wooden. Sometimes they even montage it, yeah. The but they paint it usually at the beginning, and letters written, uh, and put in the composition where. Um, you're looking at this still life. It's still about still life, but you don't make it real, realistic like before, but you know, you, you de decompose it or you, know, you, you show different views at the same time, that's what it is. Uh, paper collet, okay, it's pasted paper by this time. The bow geometric fragments of contrasting types of paper interlays Figurative motives drawn in charcoal evoking the structure of a fugue. Fugue, I assume, is a musical uh, composition or some musical teaching in which two distinct melodies intertwine in a rich, sonorous composition, each acting as a foil to the other's reality. So Brock and Picasso did the invention of the papier, means paper, collet, means collage, I think. In 1912, a revolution in Western painting whose repercussions are still being felt today by pasting fragments of paper, newspaper, wallpaper, and wood grain paper into their still life compositions. They introduce real materials and textures into an art that therefore are based on illusionistic renderings. 1913, 1914. So these are the illustrations that was described earlier. The use of papier collet on the right and pasting textures or papers onto the artwork. On the left, there are representation and symbolism as well. During World War I, you see still um, green still life, but you see a grenade, the, the object on the right bottom, like a hand holding a grenade. So, and then you see experimentation in the dots as well, uh, but they're all very flat 
And even the volumetric is flat, the shadows. The significance of this breakthrough cannot be overestimated because through this technique, these artists declared the autonomy of the painted or drawn image and radically severed it from any attempt at representation. It's a different sort of representation, obviously. The fragments attached to picture surface really followed the contours of silk wets of the drawn motifs, glasses, bottles, and musical instruments, but paradoxically contradicted, contradicted them. Thus they encountered the conventional devices of modeling and depth perspective and drew attention to the absolute flatness of the two dimensional plane. I has a better, here's a better description of Picasso's steel, green steel life. This is, the, this is the era of the synthetic cubism uh, development uh, later, simple compositions, bright colors, pointless dots, in which case intimate table runners and spider web catching the yellow light. So you can read further, I will share you this PDF. And if you'd like to get to know about what happened, uh, what were the things, the elements, the preoccupations of the artists during that time, and goes into Picasso. Actually, Picasso was at the beginning and also at the end. He was always um, consistent with this um, cubism. And how does cubism influence modern architecture? We see a reaction to cubism from Le Corbusier and Oz Farm. And it was discussed in one of the students presentation and it led to purism. Okay, and here are three musicians, they, they emphasize more on the different instruments that each musician play. And it break down to elements now, geometrical elements and much more, um, yeah. The characteristic of cubism. Here it is. Artwork is transformed to a sequence of planes, lines, and arcs. Cubism has been described as an intellectual style. Therefore, that's why architects were interested in it because the artists analyzed the shapes of the subjects and reinvented them on the canvas. That is a reinvention of the subjects. So the reviewer must re reconstruct the subject and space of the work by comparing the different shapes and forms to determine what each one represents. So through this process, the viewer participates with the artist in making the artwork make sense. All right, a representation of the different musicians as well and the instruments. Purism, let purism. And how the architect Le Corbusier was reacting to what's happening then well, since Le Corbusier is so influential with the modern and how he interpret architecture and art in his work, this movement, Purism, is later in 19, 1918 and 1925, influenced French painting and architecture. They were critical of cubism and the things that they went is more geometry, more pure in a sense, devoid of shadows, in fact. Um, less whimsical, but still the forms are there in a way. But still lack of detail as earlier when we saw the steel with green life. Uh, so, yeah, still life with green. Les enfants and uh, Le Corbusier advocate a return to clear, precise, ordered forms that were precise, the expressive of the modern machine age. And they collaborated. And this is important that this in, in the history of, of the purism movement, um, with essays published from 1920 and 1925. 
on the new spirit or less rule. So there is an essay entitled Purism, where they define painting as <coughs> an association of purified related and architectural elements. So this concept is reflected in their still life paintings with clean, pure, integral forms. So basically, Le Corbusier concentrate on neutrals, gray, black, and white, and the monochromes of green. So perhaps maybe that wet our curiosity why this minimum use of color, I mean, you paint them, you could paint them green or red or brown or whatever, but they decided to paint it white in, in architecture, for example. So it being distilled even further. Okay, you can read the rest a bit later. Purism reduced subject matter the relationship of its geometry, geometric angles and shapes, further emphasized to color it for a unified effect. These pure forms were composed of the intrinsic qualities and absence of any representational meaning. This infiltrated all aspects of the arts, including painting, design, and architecture. Now, in this day and age, we think about architecture as much more engineering, yeah? much more system thinking. But during those times, architecture is more of the humanities, part of humanities or arts and humanities. So, Although uh, with the advent of technology in ma machine age, periods artists aim to infuse me mechanical and industrial subject matter with a timeless quality. So this influence work in which shapes were lent references to ancient classical forms, absent of decoration or additional ornamentation. So this was the period's stance. And um, it says here, purism climax that Le Corbusier's Pavillon de l'Esprit Nouveau, Pavilion of the New Spirit, built in 1925. We shall see that. It's actually an international exposition of decorative and industrial arts um, during, uh, at, coincidentally with the birth of Art Deco movement, but somehow <laughs> they managed to go and show, showcase this pavilion. If you know the Art Deco movement, um, at the at the core, refer to Egyptian uh, and certain horizontal and vertical um, designs, elements not not at all like the purists. Yeah. So, but somehow uh, it was accepted here, and there you go. That is the Le Corbusier's Pavillon, the L'Esprit Nouveau, and. That in 1925, I mean, this is parallel to what he's doing in terms of in, um, the domino houses and eventually the creation of Villa Savoy. Yeah? So that, but he was also doing this. Um, some of the characteristic, like the, uh, what do you call it, that um, opening, the circular opening on the roof was found in his works later on. So the pavilion's new conception of habitable space discard all decorative notions. So they were in the promotion of this sort of forms and architecture. Um, yeah, uh, representation. So so the, the usage of reinforced concrete and steel as well, that's fairly new at that time, um, was proposed because at the moment people were still thinking about building classical architecture, okay? That was the, the it was still reluctant to accept this form. Uh, so in particular housing, it was difficult to go and push and there was an exhibition that they did where a lot of the architects designed housing in an international style. What about futurists? Now, we're going, we finished with purism and cubism. Now we're looking at futurism. 
and what developed in Italy and in Russia. Uh, first, it was in Italy, futurist, and then after afterwards, is the Russian Russian constructivist. When we we looked at the work of the New York Five earlier, <clears throat> referring to Le Corbusier, then Le Corbusier referring to purism, you can see the threads, yeah, the chain reaction or the influence of um, thought in how to create the forms, meaning into the forms. And at the same time, these things are sort of being discussed at a time in the style and, and Deutsche Werkbahn and all this among the art and artists, uh, artists and arch architects. Um, the architects, some of them were considered more of engineering. You know, it's just like now, you know, some are more into art, some are in engineering. So, so it's just, the same thing was happening there, but trying to search for the meaning of form. So, so the, the, it, the Italian futurism and Russian constructivists also influenced because they come to the style, they come to the Netherlands, uh, the Bauhaus, yeah, don't forget the Bauhaus, and they were tutors, they were lecturers, they were architects and artists. So when we talk about futurism, it's a modernist movement, movement based in Italy, celebrating the technological era. So what they, want, they want to, what's happening in society culturally at that time, politically, it influenced them as well. If the leaders were to adopt certain things or certain ideas, but culturally, what's happening culturally, and um, they cotton into the technological era, and this is picked up by the artists themselves and the architects influenced by the artists. So futuri futurism was inspired by the development of cubism, but the core preoccupations of futurist thought and art were machines and motion. So these were some of the names during 1909, but uh, Marinetti and the painters, Boccioni, Bala, Cara, Soverini, so we have the futurism as uh, artistic and social movement yeah, that originate in Italy in the early 20th century, emphasizing on speed technology, youth violence, and objects such as the car, the airplane, and the industrial city. So the, these are the personalities that were involved, the key figures glorifying modernity and aim to liberate Italy from the weight of its past. We would know that because Roman architecture and then the Renaissance, it was, Italy had a lot of, um, uh, of that in the 14th, 15th, 16th century. And a lot of the past is still there, the Coliseum and everything else. Um, so then suddenly you have Mussolini and, um, uh, and certain political figures trying to find an architecture form that, that uh, well, not consciously, but those around him were uh, promoting, for example, as you recall, Teragni, I presented that earlier, Teragni's building which was the sort of the headquarters for the smaller group uh, of the fascist movement. But before that, what happened before that? You have the futurist work. And here's a study of unique forms of continuity in space by Bocchioni. So you can distinctly look at the muscles and the figure, yeah? Running as if they're running or in motion. Why the figure? At first, it was this cars and factories and uh, war machines and aeroplanes and stuff. And then they, they look at a human figure again. Maybe it's, it's simply the Italian thing looking at human again, like the Renaissance. Dynam dynamism of a soccer player in 1913. That's the same time as Cubist movement. Some elements of Cubism, but here, how do you depict motion in art? So 
yeah. There were this influence on futurists, they, they influence art, painting, sculpture, other forms as well, ceramics, graphic design, industrial design, interior design, urban design, theater, film, fashion, textiles, literature, music, architecture, and even cooking. So futurism arguably influenced the art movements, art deco, constructivism, surrealism and Dada, and to a greater degree, precisionism, royal, rayonism and vorticism. A lot of isms there. So Marinetti, you know, it looks almost like a train, but not I mean, like something very dynamic, of course. They are introducing the idea of a new aesthetics that would take place of the old one, drenched in historical narratives and traditional forms of expression. Surpassing the limits of what is considered proper and socially acceptable, Marinetti and his futurist friends call for the destruction of museums as shrines of an outdated cultural models and insisted on creation of modern cultural ident identity. For some of them, they were a bit more extreme. They just want to destroy all the old architecture. And, and it, what helped actually was the Italians who caught up in the World War after that, World War II. So Futurist Manifesto came to response to the problematic relationship between countries past and present. Let's go to the Russian constructivists. The artist Melovich also dealt with Cubism. And this was uh, more linked to the earlier Cubism, which I, I, I mentioned that um, uh, Josh Brock and, and Picasso, they were, um, but in respect, they, the, his, the fascination with movement is still there. Woman with a pail. So where's the pail? The different, the different uh, elevations or views of the pail here. Where's the woman? Yeah, maybe you can see a hand there. So uh, again, the, um, you know, um, abstractism, um, one would call this abstract art, obviously, uh, in a very general way, but this is, the, this is what the experimentation was at that time with the use of, uh, what do you call it, um, shadows and, and light. And then they break off from it. In Suprematism, Malevich again in 1927, Publishes his book, The Non-Objective World, one of the most important theoretical documents of abstract art. And then he wrote, in the year 1913, trying desperately to free art from the dead weight of the real world, I took refuge in the form of the square. Out of the suprematist square, as he called it, Malevich developed a whole range of forms, including rectangles, triangles, and circles, often in intense and beautiful colors. These forms are floated against every usually white ground, and the feeling of color and space in suprematist painting is a crucial aspect of it. Who knows? Okay, in the chat box, who knows? Give me a name of an architect that was influenced by suprematism. Sorry? How are you? Zaha did correct, correct, yes, yes. Highly influenced, but also the others like Ram Cool Haas, you know, OMA. She did um, a unit in the, the Architectural Association School which influenced her students also to explore this. Like, what's his name? I forgot the name. Van, Van, Van Berkel, I think, and a few others. So suprematism was one of the key movements of modern art in Russia. Yeah? And um, this other name, is, which is important and influenced the Bauhaus was El Lizitsky, the Russian artist and also Laszlo Maholi Naj. You can check out the YouTube video down there. Other art that came out was Chernikov's 
Santalia from Italy also um, was, they were looking into these new forms. They, they were not built. They were not built. Um, much of these were drawings. And you can see these forms being built now, yeah, or in the last century even. And these were like headquarters for, this, for the pro proletariat and, and such like ideas. Constructivism architecture, a constructivist architecture or constructivism is a form of modern architecture that developed in the Soviet Union in 1920s. So suprematism and constructivism uh, influenced people like Zaha Hadid, inspired by the Bauhaus and a wider constructivist art movement that emerged from Russian futurism, okay? Uh, modern technology, engineering methods, and the socio-political ethos of communism. Is there a communist country in this world now? Anyone know? Korea, China. Is China called communist still? <laughs> Everybody seems to be um, capitalist now, even the Russian oligarchs. I think the answer to that is Cuba, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, there are four chats there. Sorry, who's laughing? Cuba, oh, okay. Okay, anyway. Um, yeah, it is debatable, yeah? Maybe Russia and China are still communist countries in essence. China, Cuba, Laos, Vietnam, from Google, okay. Yes, Vietnam, very interesting. It's a very interesting country. Um, inspired by the Bauhaus and why they construct this art movement that emerged from Russian futurism. Okay, Brutalis. Ah, yes. There is some characteristic of maybe James Sterling Leicester building, the engineering block, but the different way. So the Brutalis architects, some of them, and maybe even some of the Malaysian architects during the 1980s, but they look funny sometimes, the building. Okay, you can read that. Yeah, constructivist architecture is mostly remembered in writing and on paper. Two most radical and recognized structures, Vladimir Tatlin's monument to the third international and Elizitsky's Lenin Tribune was never built in scales larger than models, um, taking hold in the wake of the Russian revolution in 1917, constructivism was the result. Cubo, Cubo futurist artists marrying their connecticism and abstraction to the social concerns of the Bolsheviks in the hopes of using art as a platform to motivate changes in society. Uh, much of this is printed and, and disseminated and uh, promoted. So viewing the museum establishment as a mausoleum of art, in 1918, the new broadsheet art of the commune affirmed the proletariat will create new houses, new streets, new objects of everyday life. Art of the proletariat is not a holy shrine where things are lazily regarded, but work, a factory which produces a new artistic things. So they focus more on the workers, yeah? This structure, the Tatlin Tower is actually a model only. It never was built. And those volumes in, uh, you know, this spiraling structure um, is more of the circulation going upwards. You have one, two, three volumes there. And this is housing, how many? Yeah? There's thousands of people. There are supposed to be like huge assembly halls. Yeah. We can read in the right there. Four, four large suspended, not three, geometric structures. And they would rotate. At the base of the structure was a cube, which was designed as venue for lectures, conferences, and legislative meetings. And it would complete a rotation in the span of one year, always in rotation. 
and even housing for the executive activities. It is at that time you don't have internet, obviously you need to have a structure and a focal point in the um, urban environment so that uh, this would uh, be engaged with the public all the time, spewing um, propaganda or whatever that you need to be to inform what is happening. So you can read that. But these were actually being built. And these were more of the art decor style, as you can see on the, on the left below, vertical elements express um, in the staircases. Um, the thing that they were thinking about in terms of volumes and structures that mimic a dynam more dynamic um, image of um, machines uh, rotating things on the left and um, on the right. It's more art, art deco than anything. This is quite common actually in some other countries. Okay, so this is the reference for Zaha Hadid talking about Malevich and suprematism, which influenced her. So that is all. Um, Thank you.